you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Sang Mi Oh. I'm the Vice President of Community Impact, Diversity and Inclusion for the American Heart Association. The American Heart Association and Oregon Health and Science University have joined forces with a goal to reduce cardiovascular death, heart attack, stroke, and heart failure in our communities. It is now my pleasure to introduce Anthony Maholland, the Director of Cardiovascular Service Line at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. His tenure at OHSU has spanned 16 years where he has helped positions as cardiovascular intensive care unit charge nurse, nursing administrator on duty, and nurse manager of cardiovascular intermediate care and telemetry. Welcome, Anthony. I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Sang Mi, and thank you all for joining us today. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to have you here. Before we get started, I want to share a little bit of history about these workshops with you. Um, but even before I do that, I want to thank my team at OHSU for providing the content today and to thank our partners at, at the American Heart Association, specifically Lily Banning, who has been really busy behind the scenes helping us to produce this show for you. Uh, which is you and the American Heart Association have been in partnership for many years. We added an additional element to our partnership a little over a year ago to bring a community impact project centered on heart failure to the Portland metro area. And through that partnership, we've done a handful of great things. First and foremost, we co-created some patient information materials on heart failure. We also developed a hub, a, an online hub for heart failure patients and their families and friends. That can be found at www.oregonheartfailure.org. And we have, of course, produced these education sessions. Some of you might remember our first education center uh, session, which happened last April. And that was great. It was in person. It was back when in person was a thing. Of course, COVID-19 has changed things for us. And so we're here virtually with you today. Today, our experts are going to talk with you about ways to help you manage heart failure in the setting of COVID-19. The talks are going to include heart failure signs and symptoms. We'll do a talk on tips for cooking and healthy eating while at home, and then how to manage anxiety and focus on mental well-being during the pandemic. So, I'll start off with a great big thank you to you again for joining us, and I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Jane Mitchell. Jane is a nurse practitioner at OHSU. She's been a nurse since 1979. She's an instructor of medicine in our cardiovascular division at OHSU, and she's been a nurse practitioner since 1993. She specializes in the care of heart failure patients, specifically transitional care and patient outcomes. She provides hospital-based care and ambulatory care in our clinics, and joining her on our panel today are Dr. Deborah Myers, who is our section head for heart failure and transplantation. She's also associate professor of medicine in the division of cardiology at OHSU. Lacey Harder, our, one of our registered dietitians who serves as the clinical dietitian for our cardiovascular patients. And then Dr. Adrian Kovacs, who is a psychologist at the behavioral cardiovascular program here at Knight Cardiovascular Institute at OHSU. So that's our esteemed panel, and I would like to now hand over to Jane and um, hand the controls over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, as a reminder, there will be an opportunity to ask our panelists any questions that you have at the end. Several of you have uh, already sent us some questions and we have your answers ready, um, and we appreciate that. As we move through the discussion, feel free to go ahead and type your questions in your chat box. We're watching that and we're more than happy to answer them. We're gonna start this afternoon with Dr. Myers, Deborah Myers. Her passion for healthcare began in an unlikely place in her work as an artist. She became fascinated with the science of medicine. With her artwork, she's able to explore and appreciate the reality and the changes of the patient experience particularly when navigating the healthcare system. Dr. Myers recently joined us as section head 
for OHSU's Department of Heart Failure and Transplantation. And I'm thrilled to introduce her. So welcome, Dr. Myers. Okay, Jane, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. I really appreciate it. And as the newest Oregonian, I'm, I, I just can't tell you how delighted I am to be here and to be participating in this meeting today. Okay, next slide. Um, you know, it's a measure of where, um, how fast moving this, um, this pandemic really is that I submitted these slides about 10 days ago to the AHA and the numbers are quite different than they were 10 days ago. So I just want to up, give you some updated numbers from this morning that in Oregon now, we have 14,355 cases, and those are confirmed of COVID-19 in our state. We have, um, and uh, worryingly, we have 2,334 cases reported in the last seven days. We've been very, very lucky here in Oregon. I think we've had pretty consistent um, you know, political involvement since the beginning, and we're fortunate in many other ways. We've had a good response here. We've had 265 deaths amongst Oregonians, and that is in contrast to the 141,677 deaths that have been reported since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and again, to put that into some perspective, that means that the number of people that have now died from a COVID-19 in the United States is approximately equal to the size of Santa Rosa, California. So, um, and that would be every person who is a citizen. As you now know, because you can't escape it, COVID-19 is caused by the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2. The global pandemic was declared on March 11th, 2020, and um, underdiagnosis is likely due to the fact that the disease can be mild or asymptomatic in a large number of patients. Next slide. So what about the heart and COVID-19? Cardiovascular complications can uh, can are, are frequent in an acute, serious COVID-19 infection. This can include myocarditis, heart failure, clots, or what we call venous embolism. That can be clots in the legs, clots in the blood vessels that go to the lung. And then acute kidney injuries are also very common. COVID-19 infection has indirect effects on the heart in patients without pre-existing heart disease. That's very important to realize. And there have been a number of reports dealing, uh, detailing this. Patients with existing heart disease are more likely to be affected with COVID-19 because they fall into, by definition, a high-risk subset of patients. Patients with known cardiovascular disease or pre-existing have a worse outcome if they do become infected with COVID-19. Next slide. So who is a high-risk population? Well, in, as it turns out that this is defined right now as age greater than 65 years old, chronic lung disease or asthma, patients who have weakened immune systems from any cause, uh, and that would include both medical conditions and medications that they're taking to suppress their immune system, chronic kidney disease patients, so dialysis patients, cancer patients, patients in di that have diabetes, and residential facility patients. And of course, this also includes uh, prison and jail populations. It's estimated that one in five individuals falls into a high-risk group. Next slide, thanks. And the risk um, changes significantly with age. So under 65 years old, the risk of death if you do contract COVID 
is between 8 and 22.7 percent. So there's a lot of variability in terms of the fact that this presents as a spectrum of disease. Some people are asymptomatic, some people are mildly affected, and then some people are very severely and suddenly affected. But it's, it's estimated that as of July, that 80% of the deaths that we're still seeing are in those greater than 65 years of age. Now, in Mexico and India, the, the, the statistics are a little bit different. The majority of deaths that they're seeing in, are were in the younger age groups. And in great patients in the United States greater than 80, death rates were between 0.6 per 1,000 patients to 17.5 per 1,000. And again, there's quite a big statewide variation within the United States as well. Next slide. Young people can be affected, and it's a mistake to think that age alone is protective. COVID can result in severe disease and death at any age group, and I think that's an important take-home point. Half of the serious cases in Europe and the Netherlands are in people under 50 years of age. And a demographic shift has occurred recently in the United States, and people under 45 are making up 55% of the cases reported since Memorial Day. Now, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who has been a real um, spokesperson, who's a very renowned infectious disease doctor and uh, developed his career during the HIV epidemic, had, it was interviewed by the New York Times yesterday. And he is very much trying to appeal to the younger generation because he was stating in his interview yesterday that um, even as compared to a month ago, um, the disease is now, the average age of patients is now decreasing by 10 to 15 years. And what he's really worried about is patients thinking, wait a minute, I'm young, I'm healthy. My chances of getting sick are low. And in fact, 20 to 40% of people my age that get COVID are asymptomatic. But he was really stressing in this interview that by getting the, the infected themselves, even if they don't get very sick or don't even get a symptom, they're driving the progression of this pandemic. And so it is so important that everybody is involved in trying to prevent the spread of this disease. Next slide. What can any one individual do? Don't delay calling for help if you have chest pain or trouble breathing for any reason, whether it's COVID related or not. The hospitals now, we are very, very careful. I can assure you that precautions are being taken at every level within hospitals. We have, um, you know, task forces of, of people, experts and in infection control at uh, looking at what happens from in every aspect of patient care. Do take proper precautions. Stay at home as much as you can. Go out for essential trips only. Have a good supply of your medications and staples and essentials at home. Clean high touch surfaces in your home and doorknobs and on your car frequently. Wash your hands and generally that's for a 20 second hand wash. And do contact your do doctor if you have shortness of breath, fever, or cough. It may or may not be COVID, but your doctor will want to know. Next slide. So other trips, uh, tips for this crazy COVID time. Choose heart-healthy foods and snacks. Think plant-based and unprocessed. Get lots of rest. Don't smoke. We always say that. Don't overindulge in alcohol or food. Take your medications on schedule, maintain social distance, but do not self-isolate socially, spiritually, or emotionally. Next slide. So Dr. Fauci says, you are not a passive person in this epidemic. You're an important part of the active plan to contain this disease. Try and encourage your friends and family to do the same. Thank you very much for your time and attention today and stay safe. Next slide. Okay. And do please wear your mask in public. N95s will block 95% of the small airborne pop, uh, particles. Surgical masks like the one I wear every day blocks 80% of those particles. Um, on June 11th, policies were put in place by Oregon requiring employees, essential employees, and now we have mandatory mask wearing laws. Please 
please, please adopt them and find something that's comfortable for you. So the three best reasons to wear a mask, protect yourself, protect everybody else, and an 80% adoption of masking universally could decrease mortality up to 65%. That's a lot and it could be someone you love. Next slide. And we're all waiting for a vaccine. Well, I'm short on time right now, but most I just want to wrap up by saying most experts feel that 12 to 18 months is still optimistic because it's a very complicated process. All right, thank you very much. Happy to take questions later. Thank you so much. Um, that was really, really informative and uh, pretty sobering. Um, Next, we're going to hear from Lacey Harder, and Lacey is a clinical dietitian specialist at the OHSU. She currently covers cardiovascular, um, thoracic, and the vascular units. She specializes in nutritional support and is a certified nutrition support clinician. She teaches our heart healthy, a Healthy Heart University on Tuesdays at OHSU. She also provides individualized dietary and uh, it supports all the educational needs of our patients and our families. An interesting fact about Lacey is that she was previously a flight attendant for 13 years before she became uh, a clinic, clinical dietitian. Welcome Lacey. Lacey, and I can't help but ask you about, what about the pretzels they serve on the airlines? <laughs> Thank you. There's, there's no calories <laughs> above 20,000 feet. That's what I say. Um, thank you so much, Jane. I'm so happy to be here and provide you a little bit of our Tuesday classes with a focus on COVID-19. Um, like I said, it's a privilege to be here. I was at the first workshop with Dr. Kovacs and Dr. Camacho, and I just wanted to stand up screaming, encore, encore. So here's our encore. Um, and here we go. Let's go to the next slide. As Jane mentioned, I uh, was a flight attendant for 13 years. I went to school almost the whole time. I had a crazy busy life. And then I became a civilian and I had to teach myself how to eat, but that didn't happen until about three years into my uh, dietitian career because I was mostly doing feeding my patients through tubes and IVs. So. I'm telling you all this um, from a perspective of actually implementing it into my own personal diet and learning a lot from my patients and their family members who have been doing it um, much longer than I have. This slide here really opens our eyes uh, to the mixed messages that we hear. So it's the seven salty myths busted for the American Heart Association. I recommend uh, Googling this and just going over it and seeing which ones jump out at you. Um, the one I get mostly from my patients and then I thought myself was I don't salt my food. Um, I don't need to worry about my sodium. Not true. Over 75% of the sodium we consume is from everything but a salt shaker. So that's just one for instance. There are six more. Um, so I encourage you to go see that. Next slide, please. So why do I need to watch my salt intake? Salt is also called sodium. It's found in many foods. Sometimes, even if the food doesn't taste salty, it has a lot of sodium in it. For example, a cake mix. That's a dessert. That's a sweet dessert, but it has quite a bit of sodium in it. Uh, salt acts like a sponge and makes uh, the body hold on to water. And this makes your heart have to work harder. So in the setting of heart failure, when we have that water on us, um, our heart isn't strong enough to push the, water, the volume of blood to our kidneys to urinate it out. So it just all accumulates. We can't breathe. We feel really bad and we're not eating. So we uh, encourage weighing our, having our patients weigh each morning at the hospital when they go home and to call their doctors um, as soon as they see about five pounds hang out on their bodies of weight for three to five days, or if they're feeling crummy. You can see this, sometimes you can see it in your legs. Um, that affects some people more than others, and it builds up in your lungs too. So over time, it definitely uh, builds up, and just always call your doctor. That's what we tell our patients. So next slide, please. 
So why do I need to watch the sodium intake? Main takeaway message is it will help you stay out of the hospital. Um, it's not the, the key to curing heart failure, but it's just one element. So if, you, if you're very um, on top of it with your sodium intake, work with your doctor, see if there's a medication adjustment that can be done or something else to help uh, relieve the symptoms and move forward from there. But if you haven't addressed the sodium portion of it yet, then that is a great place to start. Um, and, oh, and in general, I encourage everyone to follow a heart healthy diet, obviously. Um, it just promotes uh, health overall. So the, the list on the right of what salt affects, um, it's just a, a small sample of the overall health that's provided by watching sodium. All right, next slide, please. No salt added. All right, so just for a visual, uh, one teaspoon of salt is 2,400 milligrams of sodium. So we tend to tell our patients to stay around 2,000 milligrams of sodium. Everybody's body is different. So some people are going to go a little low. Some people are going to go a little higher. Um, but whatever works best for that heart to function at its um, optimal performance, that's what we want. So start around 2,000. The average American consumes around 3,400 milligrams of sodium a day. So in a week, that's 10,000 milligrams of sodium more than what's recommended. So it really adds up very quickly. All right, next slide, please. Sodium awareness. So this 2,000 milligram sodium a day, as I mentioned, the American Heart Association recommends around 1,500, but the World Health Organization recommends around 2,000. So I always like to joke with my patients, you're welcome for the extra 500, um, but it's a really good place to start. And some days, like I said, you're going to go a little lower and some days you're going to go a little higher. So as long as it's around that 2,000, the studies have shown that that's a pretty good place for heart health. Um, I like to think of it as money. I can spend my money in whichever way I see fit and budget accordingly. So uh, we're not going to add salt to the cooking or eating. I don't want to spend my money that way. We're going to read the nutrition labels. That's really going to tell us a lot about what's in our food. And we're going to choose natural foods when possible. We'll talk more about all these things real quick. All right, next slide, please. Choose food naturally low in sodium. So I like to call these the free foods. They're so low in sodium, I don't, eat, I don't want my patients to worry about counting these. So these foods are fresh, canned, or frozen fruit, fresh or frozen vegetables. Now notice we didn't say canned vegetables, um, but this time of COVID, sometimes that's all you got on hand. So draining and rinsing canned veggies can save you some sodium, about 40%. It's not an exact science, um, but it's better than not doing it at all. So first and foremost, uh, we I want you to get your nutrition so you can only have canned veggies. Drain and rinse is gonna be very helpful. Dried beans, peas, rice, lentils, and old fashioned oats. Uh, always check those cans nowadays because they're always coming up with surprises in good ways so dried beans um take a long time which is fine but i know that i've seen in fred meyer any store they do have canned beans available that are zero milligrams of sodium very very good for heart health so i encourage you to uh not assume anything and go look for yourself fresh meat poultry eggs and fish unsalted nuts and seeds. I encourage my patients, if you need to eat nuts and seeds and have to have them not taste like that raw taste, uh, try roasting them. Save your sodium money for something else. And milk and yogurt. These do have sodium in them, however, uh, very, very minimal. All right, next slide, please. So no added salt. First thing we're gonna do is get rid of that salt shaker. We're gonna use herbs spices and seasonings that contain no salt uh, but have lots of flavor. So Mrs. Dash, she's come a long way. She has over 30 no salt mixes, marinades, seasonings, and blends. So I encourage you to go on her website and uh, her, she might be a person, their website 
and see what they got. I think they have a lot of these items at Winco. Penzies is, an, is another amazing salt company. Um, they have over 50 no salt seasonings and vinegars. All right, next slide, please. All right, so these are, we're not going to talk too much about these lists. They're for you to peruse. These are uh, free, sodium free, so please use as much as you like. As you see in the bottom right hand side, vinegars, most vinegars are sodium free, except for seasoned rice vinegar. So always check those nutrition labels. All right, next slide, please. These are the condiments used with caution. Anything that can hang out on a shelf for a long time, you really got to be uh, seeing a red flag there for probably a high sodium content. So check that out before you start pouring it on your food. Now, if you have to have them, small portion on the side. All right, next slide, please. Sodium awareness tips. All right, so more sodium awareness tips. Takeaway from this slide is give your taste buds two to four weeks to turn over. Um, a really great resource for some summer recipes online, free download for the American Heart Association. So you can just Google that. Um, go to the store with the list and don't go hungry. Next slide, please. Reading nutrition labels, takeaway from this is step one, look at that serving size, then look at the sodium. Multiply to how many servings you have. So something else to go over. Next slide, please. Reading nutrition labels, the takeaway from this slide is these are all the same to me. Some are regulated by the FDA, the ones up on top, the ones on bottom are not, plus some more. So please just read those nutrition labels and you be the judge if it's going to fit into your sodium budget. Next slide, please. See how you're doing ways to keep track. Uh, so pen and paper are fine. The American Heart Association has uh, Google AHA sodium tracker. You'll get this great template. Just You can print it out or just copy it on your own paper. It's a great straightforward way to keep track of your sodium. My Fitness Pal and Calorie Kings are both free apps and websites. Great resources to track your sodium. All right, next slide, please. And just read those nutrition labels as mentioned. Next slide, please. All right, this is the one. So COVID-19 shopping, grocery shopping. The panic, I think, is stopped for now. So to be safe, though, we really encourage you to have someone go get groceries for you, family members, neighbors, or a service. So you might have to pay for those. Grocery pickup options. Uh, Walmart is free. Fred Meyer, I think they do charge. CSAs are a really great way to support local economies and farmers. Um, and getting very fresh uh, vegetables and fruits and other items delivered right to your door. There's meal service companies out there. Some Basket is one of them. And I wanted to mention um, there are other services. If you are looking for food, you don't have access to food, hun OregonHunger.org is a great resource. They have a list of other resources or and or you can call 211. Uh, to help to reach out and find resources in this crazy time. So uh, first and foremost, make sure you have access to enough food. And after that, you can start to reduce your sodium intake. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lacey. That was awesome. So our final presenter is Dr. Kovacs. Adrienne Kovacs, she is a psychologist at the Behavioral Cardiovascular Program at the Knight Cardiovascular Institute at OHSU. Dr. Kovacs earned a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Memphis and completed postdoctoral fellowships in cardiac psychology at the University of Florida and the University of Toronto. In 2016, Portland got lucky and she moved here to establish and direct the Behavioral Cardiovascular Program at the Knight Cardiovascular Institute at OHSU. She is also a professor of medicine at OHSU. Dr. Kovacs, welcome and thank you for joining us today and uh, to share guidance on managing our well being during this pandemic. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And um, as the other speakers have said, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today. Next slide, please. 
You know, we often hear this term on the news, um, newscasters, um, medical experts will all describe this as an unprecedented situation, which means that we are dealing with unchartered territory, which is kind of why we're figuring some things out as we go along. We've never faced this experience either in this country or the world before. And interestingly, this is also then the first time that we are all, patients, providers, researchers, educators, general public, we are all facing the same health stressor, COVID-19. We haven't had this before. So um, the photo on the right is um, a photo that I took in my neighborhood once um, uh, um, a few weeks ago. And again, it's just reminding us of this interconnectedness we have. However, a common stressor does not lead to common experiences, interpretations, or stress reactions. And sometimes I get a little frustrated when I watch the news and somebody will be on and they might say, okay, this is how everybody's feeling right now. And I always think, we don't know how other people are feeling. People have different reactions. And the only way we can figure out how people are doing is actually to ask them. Next slide, please. Here are some possible reactions. And I, I, as a psychologist, I don't usually use the word normal. What I say is these are understandable reactions or responses. So if you've been um, experiencing some of these, know that you're not alone. Some people are noticing lower mood, less interest in usual activities, less motivation, increased stress, worry, anxiety, increased irritability. So oftentimes people will say, I'm just, I get frustrated more easily. Some people are noticing that they have concentration difficulties and maybe they're less efficient. It may take them longer to do things they can usually do more quickly. Um, some people are angry and they may be angry at themselves, uh, at neighbors, at people around them. Um, lately, I'm talking to people who are frustrated when they see people who aren't wearing masks, for example. Sometimes people feel guilty if, they, um, if things are going okay for them right now. And some people are having um, guilt because they're not struggling as much as maybe they see other people struggling. Some people are feeling hopeless or helpless. I often hear people describe fear uh, fatigue is a common one these days. It's just very tiring. Some people are confused. Some people are pessimistic, so worried about the outlook. At the same time, some people are optimism. So I think with some aspects, and sometimes people talk about looking for silver lining, and some of the advances we've made, for example, in telemedicine, hopefully that these things will continue on afterwards. So we're, we're learning things that may help us advance healthcare in other ways. And also some people do experience positive well-being at some times. Next slide, please. The CDC is um, doing some interesting research and every week for the past several months, they've been surveying thousands of Americans and they've been asking questions. Their surveys include questions about anxiety and depression. And this was the last week that was available online. And we can see that in a one week period, and Gosh, I think there were about 10,000 respondents. About a third of people reported that they had pretty significant symptoms of anxiety, and about a quarter reported symptoms of depression. And you can see here that uh, Oregon was quite similar to the rest of the country. Um, women reported um, slightly more, um, had a slightly higher prevalence of elevated symptoms than men, which is common when we look at reporting symptoms of anxiety or depression. And if we look at the age category here, um, for people who are older, it's interesting that um, the prevalence of concerning depression or anxiety symptoms decreased when people got older, suggesting better mental health outcomes. And we can sometimes look at things as a glass half full or half, half empty. I think the fact that we maybe have a third of the people who are experiencing challenges, challenges does tell us also that two thirds of the people actually are um, doing perhaps okay from a psychological perspective. Next slide, please. And in this figure here, this just provides a timeline and um, from the time the first survey was conducted um, in late April, all the way till now. And this one here is combined symptoms of any anxiety or depression. And we can see it stayed pretty consistent. So somewhere between that 35, 40% mark. Again, this is much higher than we see when we are not in a pandemic though. So um, this is the reason why 
we're often talking about coping with stress and how we can how we can manage a bit better. Next slide, please. And I often hear people say this lately, um, healthcare is changing so rapidly and I hear patients and providers also sharing that concern. Next slide, please. So people are reporting these transitions. So we used to have most of our visits in clinic. Then we went to telemedicine for most visits. Now we are uh, many places still having telemedicine visits, but reintroducing some in-person visits, and we don't know what the future will look like. So we don't know whether telemedicine capability will be here to stay. A lot of organizations had to implement things pretty quickly, and it's impressing the, the speed at which they did so. Next slide, please. And so as we move from visits in clinic to telemedicine, it's a transition. It, change, it takes um, effort and time to get used to. There is changing technology. Uh, convenience aspects. So people don't have to travel, people don't have to leave their home. There is some, um, there's some evidence that it can actually improve patient provider relationships and patient provider satisfaction for the, for the convenience and the ability to still maintain that connection. Next. And so it's interesting, sometimes the same people who would say, gosh, I'm not ready to go to telemedicine are also saying, wait, you want me to come back to clinic now? And I would just like to let people know that we do so, people make this decision based on patient and provider readiness and safety, as well as changing hospital or clinic protocols. Next slide. So some strategies to cope with these healthcare uh, transitions. First, remember that patients cannot read providers' minds. Providers cannot read patients' minds. So we can let other people know whether we have questions and concerns. So, um, as a healthcare provider, it's, if you have any concerns about this, it's always wise to let your patients know. Similarly, as a patient, if you're not confident in your ability to do this, if you say that you have poor Wi-Fi, you're not that tech savvy, then you can call ahead and perhaps request a telephone visit. And I think that teams are trying to be as accommodating as possible. So let people know ahead of time. Prepare for visits by knowing who, what, where, when, and how. So who are you going to meet? Um, what provider um, will that be? Is it just you who should be in attendance or do you wanna have somebody with you? You can always have a family member or friend there with you for your virtual visit if you like. What actually is going to happen in that visit? So to get a sense of if you're meeting with one person, um, what is the focus of that visit? The where question is where you will be for that. So is there a place in your home where it's confidential and you feel safe, you have some privacy? I've actually done telemedicine visits. Some people have been to their car, gone to their car for that. When? Always make sure you know the date, the time, and log on early to get prepared. And logistically know how it will happen. So um, do you need to download an app ahead of time to make this possible? And the other thing I'll add there is uh, if you need hearing aids, have that, have a pen, just like an uh, in-person visit, have a notepad and pen to take down notes. You can have your medications in front of you. I personally like it if people have pets that they've been talking about all of these months or these years, bring in your pet and show me your pet. So be prepared for the visit, decide how you'd like to take control of it and consider asking why. And the goal before and during the pandemic is to provide the best care possible for each patient, considering a patient's heart function along with all other concerns. So that's why as healthcare providers, we're balancing cardiac needs with COVID situation as well. Next slide. General tips for coping with the pandemic. Focus on behaviors within our control. It's very easy to think about all of the things that are not in our control as individuals. So let's think about those things that are within our control. The first, as Dr. Meyer has mentioned, is infection hygiene. So wear masks, physical distancing, hand washing. These self-care activities are even more important now. So focusing on sleep, diet, physical activity. Manage your news consumption. So I can tell you that this weekend I took a news vacation. I didn't watch the news on TV. I didn't follow the social media. I needed a break. And so it can sometimes get easy for some people especially as they're home a lot, 
to keep the TV on or to look at social media on their um, on the computer or the phone. We have that all the time. When I was a kid, my parents could get news in two ways, either the nightly news or the morning newspaper. Now we have 24 hour news availability. Just because it's there doesn't mean we need to um, take advantage of it. Distraction works. What are things we can do to take our mind off the situation? Guilty pleasures are okay. Think about how we connect with others and have a proactive approach to that. Reach out to our loved ones. This next one here, what we wear can seem kind of silly, but this is a tip that actually cardiac patients have taught me. So what they've said is, and sometimes people will come to see me in clinic when we had clinic visits and they would describe feeling really poorly, but boy, oh boy, would they ever be put together in their outfits. And sometimes they say, this is what they learned. If they are feeling down or not feeling great physically, not feeling great emotionally, that is when they wear their brightest clothing or their favorite baseball cap or the brightest, biggest pair of earrings. So here's an opportunity to decide. And it's easy when we get home sometimes to wear comfy loungewear. And for some people that works, figure out what works for you. We also get to decide how we support others. And activity pacing is important. So this is not um, a sprint, this is a marathon. So let's make sure that we're not overdoing things. And final slide, please. And just to conclude, I'd like to share you some lessons that I've learned from patients. It is understandable to have an emotional reaction to a challenging situation. I would be surprised if people weren't having any psychological reactions at all. Some days will be better than others. In fact, some weeks will be better than others. Other people might think about things differently. There isn't one right way to think, feel, or cope. We can develop skills to help us cope with uncertainty in transition. And we often surprise ourselves with how resilient we can be. Every day I'm in clinic, I'm always inspired by the people that I work with. I was at the Japanese garden recently and I wrote down this note. They had um, a, a sign as you were exiting and it said, you're doing great, just keep keeping on. And I thought that is going to be my personal motto as well during this pandemic. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Kovacs. All of our speakers, incredible. Thank you, thank you. Love to see some uh, questions coming up and I'm gonna get us started a little bit with some questions that came in before, um, at, before this started. Uh, a few people did have questions about access to care. And what I would say about that, um, we do have some specific answers for OHSU, but I think if you're from different institutions, it might be best to go to those institutions and ask for, um, or contact their business office, ask for social workers to help you. Um, that would be the best. The other thing you can do is you can send an email to Lily and um, that's how you registered. And uh, we will, I will try to get back to everybody and answer questions. Um, so I'm gonna start with the first question. And uh, this is gonna be for Dr. Meyer. Why are people that have heart failure at higher risk are they, or are they at higher risk for getting COVID? Yeah, and, and, and they are um, because heart failure, it's not, unfortunately, it's not just a pump problem. It's a systemic disease and it makes people somewhat more fragile. So anyone with any form of cardiovascular disease by definition is, is in a high risk group and probably um, they need to take addition, the, as many precautions as they can and ask their family if they would do the same for them. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Lacey? Um, I've heard a lot of this from some of our patients. They want to know if it's safe to eat fresh fruits and vegetables at this time. They're worried about getting COVID from touching the vegetables that they get at the grocery store. Understandable. Um, I say yes. The food safety guidelines are the same as pre-COVID. Wash your hands as soon as you get home from the grocery store. Wash your hands again after you put all your food away. Of course, wash scrub. Uh, the interactions around others is the biggest issue. So uh, getting the food from the grocery store, uh, you're more in control of that. You can be really quick, wear your mask, grab your stuff, sanitize. But 
uh, when you get food from somewhere else or if you're going out to eat, are people wearing masks? Are they social distancing? Are they washing their hands? So I'd be more concerned about that side of it, but definitely uh, this is uh, not a reason to not eat fruits, fresh fruits and vegetables. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Kovacs, I'm, I'm hoping you could tell me, what if, is there one specific thing that you could recommend to all people to help them with the social isolation? Uh, social isolation. I think that having a plan in place and a proactive approach to this is really important. So sometimes people will wait until they feel lonely to try and reach out. And when people get really lonely, it's sometimes harder to reach out. What I find that's being really helpful is to have these things scheduled ahead of time. So if you have a chat with a friend to actually when you finish that phone call to schedule or the, the FaceTime or Skype call to schedule the next one and, and, and do that with a few people. If you have a few loved ones, family members, friends, the nice things we can connect with people all over. Um, I'm Canadian, so I know how important it is to be able to reach out to people who live far away and, but have those plans. So whether it's, um, you know, having a, uh, a weekly movie night, for example, or a game night, or once a week, this is when I chat with these certain people can actually be really, really helpful. But we know that we have it and on our schedule and to look forward to. I realize there are some people that don't have a lot of people who they can reach out to. I do know that Oregon has a nice, um, I don't know the website offhand, but there, there's a website for older people who are lonely who are lonely and have some social isolation. So I would say, if you feel that there aren't people that you can reach out to, I would take advantage of that resource. Um, and if there are people you can um, reach out to, reach out to them proactively. Because my guess is if you're feeling you could use some connection, they're probably feeling the same also. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, this is gonna be for Dr. Myers. What, what do I do if somebody in my household has symptoms of COVID? Well, I think the advice from the CDC right now is that that patient would need, or the person who has symptoms would need to contact their own physician, arrange to get testing. Now, our, the turnaround time from testing, uh, routine testing is somewhere between 48 hours and seven days, depending on where you go. So we would recommend until those um, to be very conservative, to assume that person um, has COVID-19, they should probably use their own separate bathroom. They should probably have their meals in their room. And even though that sounds quite draconian, it's really to protect everybody else in the household. Again, sometimes people have to be tested several times in order to really get a confirmatory test that's accurate. So I would say to keep in very close contact. I think that person should probably keep their towels and their laundry and their kitchen utensils as segregated as they can for the rest of the family, especially if there's at-risk family members in the family. Okay, great, thank you. And along that same line, is it safe for cardiac and heart failure patients to go to the store to get their groceries? Yes, I think as long as they are taking all the precautions that they can, they're maintaining social distance. Um, some, some stores are actually easier to do that in than others. Um, I think you'll probably figure that out pretty quickly. Some stores, you can um, go up to the, the store, grab your grocery cart. You can, they have sanitizers for your hands, for your carts. Uh, some stores will actually sanitize the carts for you. And then some stores are just physically easier. They're just bigger and easier to maintain distance. You can also choose shopping hours where it's going to be less congested. Don't go during the busiest times. And um, the other thing is that there's, there's quite a lot of variability in terms of businesses um, enforcing the mask wearing amongst their um, employees. And so you want to go to stores where they're actually enforcing those things. And um, so that's an important issue. And if you're not comfortable with what your local store is doing where you shop, 
I would encourage you to speak to the manager of the store because actually they're required by law now. They're, the food, say, you know, food workers are considered essential workers and they are actually mandated to wear masks and use precautions. So, um, you know, be polite, be nice, don't get in any big fights with people and stress yourself out that way, but make careful choices about where you're shopping and, and you know, and your hand washing when you come home, do a 20 second hand wash uh, before you get into all your shopping bags, all very important. And then one of the things, um, Dr. Kovacs, that you talked about as far as of finding something to stress release. It's the same question, and I'm, I'm gonna ask Dr. Myers about this. Is it safe to go for walks outside? Yes, contrary to what we preached a uh, 100 years ago when we told all the heart failure patients, don't do anything, we now say, please get out and do symptom-limited exercise. And we are having beautiful weather here in Portland. The greenery is beautiful. We're lucky to be here. And I think looking at the horizon, taking a symptom limited walk. In other words, you don't want to you don't want to uh, exercise so hard that you feel distressed, but you want to also feel like you're exercising a little bit. And it's lovely to move your body in space. And guess what? It's relaxing. It helps you sleep better. And again, it's an activity where you can actually see your neighbors from a distance and wave hello and shout across the driveway and say, how are you doing? And that can actually be very nice. So I would encourage people to definitely try and work their exercise program into their day and their routine. Okay, thank you. Jane, Jane can I add something to her answer? I think um, I was a psychologist, um, not an exercise physiologist, physician, nurse. However, I always recommend medically approved physical activity. And not just because uh, it has important cardiovascular and physical health benefits. We know that it's great for our psychological health. And to get the emotional health benefits, it doesn't matter how fast we go, what activity, how intense it is, how long it is. So even just a few minutes a physical activity often makes us feel better. And there's also research to show that interacting with nature helps us, helps improve our mood. So, so to me, this is a nice free um, stress management strategy. And I've never met anybody who says, oh, I feel worse after I, after I get a little bit of exercise. Great, thank you so much. Um, Lacey. A lot of our patients are on um, fixed incomes, and especially now, um, uh, people having problems uh, affording some of their foods. How can you make, um, is there a tip about making heart healthy meals on a fixed income? Do you have suggestions? Well, uh, just before I forget, Dr. Myers mentioned some amazing things, and thank you for doing that. Uh, and one other thing about grocery shopping is some stores do have special early um, senior and or high risk hours. So um, please check on their websites and they're still having those. Um, as far as on fixed incomes, um, a lot of the stuff crosses over pre-COVID to, to now. Um, but now it's, like I said, food security is number one, and then we can start to uh, work with what we have. And uh, I, I, first and foremost, I want my patients' diuretics to work when they go home. Um, so make sure you are working with your doctor on that. Uh, but there are things like frozen veggies, they're picked at peak season and they're cheaper than the fresh stuff and they're ready when you are. So. Things like that uh, are really good to have on hand. The fresh items, not so much, but you you have to try. You have to eat sodium. Your body needs it. Um, so figuring out the natural foods that are the sodium free foods uh, for your budget and uh, having to eat those high sodium, more of a shelf stable because you're not getting food as easily. Um, things on hand that you have to eat. Uh, fitting those into your sodium budget uh, when you need to. So, uh, and then you can mix and match and uh, do whatever you need to do to get that adequate nutrition. Great. Okay. Thank you. 
uh, Dr. Myers, how do I differentiate between some of my heart failure symptoms that are very similar to COVID symptoms? Yeah, and that's a great question. And in fact, um, I had a patient recently who thought he was getting COVID, but in fact was having a, and he did not seek attention because he was having a flare of his cardiac symptoms. And it, it, it's very, very worrisome. I think the best thing that you can do is when in doubt, get on the phone and, and give your healthcare professional a call. Check it out. Um, you know, we're, we're all trying to figure out ways to be available to you. There's, you know, that would be a great, um, you know, a great, we could have a virtual visit and stream you that way and say, hey, that doesn't sound so good. Maybe I'm gonna figure out a way to meet you over in the ER or meet you in clinic. Um, and it, things like that. So when in doubt, involve your doctor. Again, there are things that we tell heart failure patients that are just objective measures that you can figure out, like, you know, has your weight gone up? Or, you know, um, did someone bring you salty food and now you're more short of breath and, you know, and you're, and you're weighing yourself in the morning, your weight's sort of consistently going up and you're getting swelling in your legs. You know, that may be more characteristic but again, of, of a, you know, of a heart failure exacerbation. But on the other hand, check with your doctor. We're here, we're here to support you. And I, I've noticed too that a lot of our patients are afraid to come in to see us. So if you could comment on that, probably the same. Right. And so again, you know, this is where virtual visits can be really useful. This is where um, the things, the uh, procedures that we're implementing in the clinic, for example, we're, um, we're cleaning the, uh, we're socially distancing people in large waiting rooms. We have the chairs way far apart. We're screening everybody before they get in the elevators to go to clinic. Um, they, instead of sort of waiting in the, uh, a crowded, um, um, you know, waiting room for a long time, they're being ushered straight to an exam room. The exam room is being sanitized completely between every patient. So we are doing all sorts of things to keep you safe. And again, you know, particularly here in Oregon, we're, we're very, very lucky. I mean, we have not been hit as hard. I don't know, I don't have a crystal ball, who knows what's gonna happen, but we are taking, I think the salient point is everyone's masking, uh, we're doing the best that we can, and I think that your risks are minimal and if you are sick, it's probably important we see you. Great, thank you okay. so much. Well, I don't see any other questions in our chat box. You guys, amazing job. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank also our audience uh, for joining in our conversation on managing heart failure during COVID-19. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Anthony Mulholland, Dr. Myers, Lacey Harder, and Dr. Kovacs for the wonderful information that they shared with us today. I hope this was useful to everyone. It certainly was for me. Um, we will be sending a link uh, with the recording and the resources to all the registered attendees. And this is a, um, for those of you that haven't seen this, this is our, uh, the URL that you can go to and you can log on to this and we have some great resources for you. Um, and on behalf of the American Heart Association and OHSU, we would like to thank you for attending. Thank you so much. Stay healthy and be well. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you.